Okay, kiddos, as promised, we're back for part two of exam five review. And actually, I've done a little bit of work here to speed things up a little bit for us. I'm not sure if you guys want to see me find molecular weights and uh, balance equations anymore, so we're speeding this up just a little bit. Uh, we're going to start with number nine, which is a limiting reactant problem. Now, I can identify number nine as a limiting reactant problem. As I read through it, I give you 45 grams of benzene, which is one of my reactants, and 45 grams of chlorine, which is the other. So I'm giving you the mass of two reactants and asking you how much of the chlorobenzene I can produce. Now, if you remember, the way we do this is we do the stoichiometry twice, and we pick the, we pick the answer that can produce the smallest amount of product. The other reactant is called the excess reactant and the one that produces the least amount of product is called the limiting reactant because it limits how much product I can produce. So let's read through number nine quickly. Chlorine reacts with benzene to produce chlorobenzene and hydrogen chloride. So here's the reaction and you'll notice it's nicely balanced. Two chlorines, one and one make two. Six carbons and six carbons. Six hydrogens, five there and one there makes six. So that's balanced for us. Determining the limiting, re the limiting reactant at 45 grams of benzene reacts with 45 grams of chlorine. We'll ignore the next part of the sentence and we'll find the mass of chlorobenzene that is produced. So, I'm starting with 45 grams of each reactant. And you'll notice I go from grams to moles of each reactant. And of course I found these molecular weights simply by using the periodic table and adding the masses of each element together. So six carbons and six hydrogens. Each carbon weighs 12.01, each hydrogen weighs 1.01. When I add those together, I get 78.12 grams per mole. And Cl2, each chlorine weighs 35.45, so two of them would weigh 70.90. So we'll go from grams to moles of each reactant, and then we'll go from moles of each reactant to moles of the product I'm interested in, which is my chlorobenzene, you know, these are both pretty little one-to-one -one ratios. So, one-to-one -one and one-to-one. -one. And then I'll go from moles of my product to grams. And the chlorobenzene is the weight of six carbons, five hydrogens and a chlorine added together, and I got 112.56 grams per mole. And so I did the math. I took 45 divided by 78.12. It's on the bottom. Um, you don't need to multiply and divide by 1, unless you really want to. And then I multiply by 112.56. It's on the top, so I multiply by it. And I got 64.8. Then I did the same thing for the chlorine. 45 divided by the 70.90 times the 112.56, and I got 71.4. So the one that makes the least amount of product is my limiting reactant. So C686 was my limiting reactant and it would allow me to make 64.8 grams of my chlorobenzene, not 71.4. Okay? All right, number 10. Number 10 is sort of fun because it was interesting to balance. It's how we extract gold from gold-bearing rock. And of course, they use a cyanide to do that. Well, not of course, but they do use a cyanide to do that. It forms a, a gold cyano complex, which dissolves in water, which then we can extract the gold from quite easily. Um, but to balance this equation, it was really quite difficult. We have four uh, in front of gold, eight in front of the sodium cyan uh, cyanide, and that means I had to have eight sodium, so I had four here and four there. That gave me eight cyanides. Four times two is eight cyanides. And then I ended up with four hydrogens, so I put a two in front of H2O to give me four hydrogens. That gave me four oxygens. Two plus two is four, and it's balanced. Now they took a thousand grams of a gold-bearing rock and it had three percent gold by mass. So three percent of a thousand would be 30.0 grams of gold by mass. Um, what else are we going to do? We're going to find the theoretical yield of the gold cyano complex and then we're going to find out what our uh, percent yield was or is if we collected 38.790 grams of the gold cyano complex. So we're going to start with 30 grams of gold. We're going to go from grams of gold to moles of gold. Put a one by mole. 
And let's see, what is the atomic mass of gold? 196.97. Okay, so grams of gold are gone. Then we're going to go from moles of gold to moles of what we're after, which is this sodium gold, this dicyano complex. And the ratio is, let's see, four golds to four of those sodium gold cyano complexes. Okay? And then all we need to do is go from moles of that to grams of that. You guys getting the hang of this yet? Okay, put a one by mole. We just have to figure out the weight of that. So let's go ahead and clear this out. We have a sodium, which is 22.99 grams per mole. And the gold, we just looked that up, that's 196.97 grams per mole. And then we have two carbons. So we've looked carbon up earlier on this review. They're 12.01 a piece. And we have two nitrogens. Now we haven't looked nitrogen up on this review. So 14.01, 14.01 for each nitrogen. So two times 14.01 gives me a total of 272.00 grams per mole. So let's figure out how much of the complex I can make. So we have 30 divided by 196.97 uh, times 4 and divided by 4 times 272 and we end up with 41 0.4. So I should be able to produce, theoretically, 41.4 grams of the complex. That's how much I should be able to produce in a perfect world. Okay, now, is that how much I did produce? Nope, I only produced 38.790. So 38.790 out of 41.4 gives me a percent yield of, let's see, 38.790 out of 40, 41.4 is 93.7% yield. Okay, so not too bad. Almost a 94% yield. So once again, this was basic stoichiometry with a little bit of rouge and lipstick on it at the end. I had grams of gold. I wanted to find grams of the sodium gold cyano complex, and that would be my theoretical yield. And then I found my percent yield if I only gathered 38.79 grams of it. Ended up with almost a 94% yield. Okay, now the rest of the review uh, is with regards to your um, kinetic theory chapter. Number 11 says describe a system at equilibrium. So I'm just going to put one on here for you quickly. Let's say I have H2O solid and it's at equilibrium with H2O liquid. What does that mean? What does it mean? How would I describe that system at equilibrium? Well, equilibrium means the rate at which the products are being formed is equal to the rate at which the reactants are being formed. Notice the arrow goes both ways. We form product, and at the same time we are forming reactants. Now this happens at sea level when the temperature is at zero degrees Celsius. What happens to water when it's zero degrees Celsius? What happens at the freezing or melting point of water? Well, obviously, water melts. Well. If it melts at zero degrees Celsius, that's also its freezing point, by the way, won't it be freezing at zero degrees Celsius? So the rate at which it's melting is equal to the rate at which it's freezing. Okay, and we say when that happens, when the rate of the forward reaction is equal to the rate of the backwards reaction, we say the system whoops, is at equilibrium. Now, here's another reaction here. This one shows the production of ammonia, and the equation is balanced for us. We're going to use Le Chatelier's principle uh, to predict how each of these changes affect the ammonia 
equilibrium system. So nitrogen, gas, and hydrogen, gas, react to form ammonia, gas. Now, let's say I take some hydrogen and I take it away from the system. I remove that out of my reaction container. The Chatier's principle states that when we place a stress upon a system in equilibrium, the system will adjust to relieve the stress. So the stress I've just um, added to this system is I've taken away hydrogen. I've removed it. So how is the system going to adjust to relieve that? Well, I claim it will shift towards the left. When I shift towards the left, won't I make more hydrogen and nitrogen, which allows me to replace the hydrogen that I've just taken away. So here I would say it would shift towards the left to replace the hydrogen that I've taken away. What if I've added ammonia to the system? Now, ammonia is a, is a gas. If I add ammonia to this, that's a stress to the system. I have too much ammonia now. So how is the system going to deal with it? Will it shift to the right and make more ammonia? No, that will compound the problem. Remember, I've added ammonia. I don't want to add even more. Or will it shift to the left to create more reactant to get rid of the ammonia? And that's what happens. So if I add ammonia here, it will shift to the left to get rid of it. What if I add hydrogen to the system? So in letter A, I removed hydrogen, but now in letter C, I'm adding hydrogen to the system. Let's see, adding hydrogen. So if I add this, will I shift left to make even more? Nope. I will shift right to get rid of what I added, and I'll make more product. So in this case, it will shift to the right. Now, I happen to know that this reaction is exothermic. So I'm going to put heat on the right-hand side of this equation. So I'm going to add a letter D to this. What would happen if I were to increase temperature? I were to make it hot. Well, let's see, if I made it hot, would it shift right and produce more heat? Hmm. No, that doesn't sound right. The stress on the system is getting hotter. So if I shift right, I'm not going to add more heat. That'll compound the problem. So that means I must shift to the left and use up that heat. So in this particular case, if I increase the temperature, I will shift to the left. OK? All right. Number 13 deals with something called the heat of fusion. Heat of fusion is the quantity of heat to melt something at its melting point. Now remember, when you're at the melting point of a substance, the temperature does not change. All of the energy that you're adding goes into the melting process, not in raising the temperature. So the delta T in these problems are zero. Now I give you the heat of fusion in kilojoules per mole. But I give you the mass of gold, or methanol, excuse me, in grams. So I have 25.7 grams of methanol. Now methanol has the chemical formula CH3OH. And if I would like to use this as a conversion factor, I have to get out of grams and into moles. So I'm going to go from grams of methanol and into moles of methanol. Put a 1 by mole. And let's see what the molecular weight of methanol is. We have a carbon, which is 12.01. We have four hydrogens, which are 1.01 apiece. And we have an oxygen, which is 16. So I get 32.05 grams per mole. Okay, so grams of methanol are gone. Now I can use my heat of fusion as a conversion factor, I can get out of moles of methanol and into kilojoules. See, it's 3.22 kilojoules per mole. Put a 1 by mole. 3.22 kilojoules per mole. So moles are gone. So let's see what we get here. Uh, 25.7 divided by 32.05 times 3.22. Looks like I'm allowed three sig figs. So how does 2.58 kilojoules sound? So that would be the amount of energy I'd need to add to melt that much methanol 
at its melting point. Okay, we're running out of time, so I don't think we're going to do the entire review. I'm going to talk about each of them quickly. Um, how much heat is involved when 275 grams of ammonia gas condenses to a liquid at its, at its boiling point. So here we're going to use the heat of vaporization instead of the um, heat of fusion. Ammonia has the formula NH3. We saw that in a problem just a moment ago. So you'd attack number 14 very, uh, in a very similar way as to how we attack 13. We'd start with grams of ammonia. We'd go from grams to moles of ammonia. And then we go from moles of ammonia to kilojoules required to evaporate it, which is 23.3 kilojoules per mole. And you'd have to figure out the molecular weight on your own. Okay. Explain the relationship between vapor pressure, atmospheric pressure, and boiling point. So now this is at the very beginning of our kinetic theory chapter. So if I had a container, let's put water in it. Okay, put a little dome over this, we'll seal it off. Now, when I do that, won't water particles leave the surface of my liquid? That's called evaporation. And they start bouncing around in my container. After a period of time, won't some of those particles return to the surface of the liquid? And if they have a low enough energy, they'll become a liquid again. Now, the particles bouncing around in here are exerting a force. They're slamming up against the walls of the container. That force is called the vapor pressure. Now, if I heat this up, more liquid will turn into a gas and the vapor pressure would increase. If I cool it down, more gas would turn into a liquid and the vapor pressure would decrease. Now, it turns out that when the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure, the liquid will begin to boil. In fact, that's the definition of boiling point. When the vapor pressure of the liquid is high enough, that means it's hot enough, to where it equals the vapor or the atmospheric pressure, the gas bubbles inside the liquid start to form. And they will boil, or we will turn a liquid to a gas anywhere throughout the liquid. So go back and review what atmospheric pressure is and the concept of boiling. Remember, as atmospheric pressure decreases, we don't need as much energy to boil something, so boiling point lowers. So here in Salt Lake City, water does not boil at 100 degrees Celsius like it does at sea level. Okay, And then finally, number 16. Why does it take more energy to boil 10 grams of liquid water than it does to melt 10 grams of liquid ice? So this deals with states of matter. Remember, liquid particles, you know, they're close to each other. They're held together by hydrogen bonds. Okay, And when I go from a liquid to a gas, I'm separating their huge distances away from each other. I'm breaking the hydrogen bonds that hold the water molecules together. However, when I go from a liquid, actually I'm melting, sorry, when I go from a solid to a liquid, I have this structured crystalline solid made up of water molecules, and I'm going to this unstructured liquid. So the particles are still attracted to each other, but we're just losing that nice crystalline pretty structure. So when we go from a liquid to a gas, we need energy to break the bonds that are holding the water molecules together. Here, we're just disrupting the shape of the crystalline structure to where it becomes a, a liquid, and liquid particles, when they're stuck to each other, do not really have a shape as they would uh, as a solid. Okay, hope that helps you out. There's a quick review on kinetic theory for you. Make sure you review your kinetic theory uh, notes. About 25% of your test will be on kinetic theory. All right. Have a great day, folks. Bye-bye.